Hello, uh, good afternoon and welcome to Estrad. I also say welcome to our speakers, uh, Vinit Parida and David Schödin from Luleå University of Technology. They will present insights from Swedish companies about how to develop digital business models. But first a few words about ESPRI, the organization that arranged these lectures. My name is Helen Torgimsson and I work as a project manager at ESPRI. We disseminate research-based knowledge in different ways through these Estrad lectures, through our magazine Entré, and also our website, esprit.se, with both web TV and a lot of articles about innovation, entrepreneurship, and SMEs. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for the latest entrepreneurial news. Today's lecture will start in a minute. We don't have any break. Uh, we will be ready at 4.20, yeah. right? <laughs> then we have a prize ceremony for Nytt och Nyttigt, a thesis competition uh, that Esprit arranged together with Vinova. Uh, about the uh, after the ceremony, uh, which takes about 10 to 15 minutes, we will serve Fika in this room. I would like to thank our main partners, Tillväxtverket and Vinova. And this uh, lecture is organized together with DIGIN, uh, Digital Innovation of Business Models in Industrial Ecosystems. So, uh, let's give Vinit and David a big hand. Welcome. Thank you, Helena. Need to find our slides among all these beautiful people. Uh, right. Hmm. Great. Now that we have technology working. Uh, so my name is Vinit, and I'm David. And we are going to, of course, talk about digitalization uh, and business model. And our hope is that today we can enlighten you with some of the opportunities as well as threats and lessons learned that we have uh, gathered by interviewing companies, but also through our academic publications. Before we start, it could be nice to maybe get a sense of who we are speaking with. Uh, we have, of course, glanced through the list of participants here, but it's always nice to get a sense of who are present in this room. So, if you are representing a, let's say, governmental institution, could you raise your hands? All right. Mm -hmm. Great. Are you representing industry? Companies? All right. Startups? Uh -huh. Any fellow academics in the room? Okay, that's a great mix. So we, we hope we can deliver to all of you. Uh, I think it's going to be possible. Uh, so for the agenda of today, uh, I think we're going to start by just presenting a little bit about us, uh, in Binet, who we are, what type of research we do. And we're also going to present a bit about our research team, because we're also trying to build a bit bigger uh, things up in Luleå. Uh, next, we're going to talk to you about digitalization. Uh, what it means, at least for us, how we see it. And we're going to try to pinpoint three traps that we see for industry in this transition of, uh, of the industry. And after that, we're actually going into the business model aspects of digitalization. Uh, quite a lot of uh, different areas we can focus on, but we're, we're at least going to exemplify three lessons from the studies that we've do, done in the with industrial companies. Uh, and after that, we're going to zoom out from business model to actually provide you with the future scenarios for digital business modeling. And I think we're going to present you what we think is up and coming and how companies are thinking about it. Uh, and I think it depends on how you want to view it. It could both work either way, threat and opportunity. And finally, of course, we want to talk with you a little bit about some of the academic insights we have uh, that have been published material or, or in progress uh, under review to share with you the insights we have gathered and try to consolidate into some uh, informative frameworks. And 
key takeaways at the end. Uh, during this presentation, we have planned for an hour. We have also thought about few places where we can have questions and interactions with you. Uh, however, please save your questions till the end. We will have around 15, 20 minutes to exchange some thoughts, and we hope we get a lot of uh, interesting questions from you that hopefully we can answer or also take it back with us. So uh, David and me, we work at Lulu University of Technology. We have a span of many research topics we work on. Uh, probably one of the first ones that we started to work quite early, probably 2010, has been very much about servitization. So manufacturing companies starting to move away from selling products towards selling services and the whole spectrum, trying to sell almost, almost like an outcome-based contracts or result-oriented contracts. And, uh, of course, that is a major transition for, uh, for industrial companies. And in, at its core, it is a bit of a business model innovation. So we have been looking into many different ways of how companies are really de redeveloping the way that they create value, deliver value, and capture value uh, towards their customers. Uh, digitalization is something we have started to study more or less five years back, I would say. And what is unique about most of our studies tends to be that we are looking into how digitalization doesn't in only interrupt the individual company, but actually your ecosystem. And I think that is where things start to get really interesting. And then to, a bit to our background, both me and Vinit actually in our PhD studies focused quite a bit on open innovation and how companies can benefit from managing better uh, collaborative innovation with different types of partners. And I, I think that core still remains quite a bit with us. And finally, I think this is an important topic as well, circular economy or sustainable industry. And we will try to explain you how all that tags along to the research we are doing. Of course, in addition to research, we are aiming for research outputs. Uh, well, together we have more or less 200 journal and conference publications in spanning across in industrial marketing to operation management to innovation management. So we are quite broad. Uh, we also write quite regularly towards uh, practitioner papers, uh, Ericsson Business Review or Emit uh, magazine, as well as being uh, sharing some of our opinions in the blogs and newsletters. Um. Of course, to do all this work, we require some funding, and I think we have been quite fortunate to have strong funding from Vinova over multiple years, and also uh, Formas is a recent one. So we're, we have been um, quite active over the years in both acquiring funding, but also working on, on different projects. Uh, we are also very happy that we have had the opportunity to, co to collaborate with colleagues from Finland and, and Norway also on certain projects. So TechS and uh, the Research Council of Norway are Highly appreciated for that. Yeah. I think I'm going to go a little faster looking at the clock uh, and put all the people up here directly. Um, and I think this is the research team that we, be, we are working with. Uh, the research we are presenting is not only done by us. It's a team effort. And I think we are grateful to have really good colleagues, some of them who have graduated or worked with us and did PhD. For example, Xavier and has moved to now Lund. Sambit has moved to Lynch, uh, Yon Shopping. And uh, Vipke continues to be with us. Two new PhD candidates, and I think what we are also proud of is having uh, visiting professors that are working with us uh, to be able to bring in different competences. Uh, I think their, uh, their topics that they're working with is listed under here, but kind of provides inspiration to the topics we are talking about today. So I guess the top two ones up on there on the right is quite leading academics in these fields, and then we have two young up-and-coming researchers that have started working with us, so we're very happy about that. It's nice to have hungry researchers collaborating with you. Uh, all right, so uh, what we are presenting today builds quite a bit on more than 200 plus interviews that we have done during the last three years, and maybe something which is important to highlight, and it would colors a lot what we are presenting today is that we have mainly been looking into B2B setup, so business to business setting, um, and, and that kind of narrows down where our insights come from. So if you are talking more towards consumers, maybe we haven't really tagged along those issues. Um, and of course, a lot of companies from different industries, so it is from mining, forestry, construction, manufacturing, as well as shipping. What is probably unique about most of our studies tends to be that we try to study phenomena that we are talking about, which is digital business model innovation, in an ecosystem environment. So multiple actors trying to co-create value towards, let's say, one customer, in this case, Bully, then being a case. Um, and, and I think you will hear mining industry very prominently described in our um, 
in our presentations because I think Sweden is a great example of both suppliers and very highly demanding customers being present in this environment. So a lot of much is happening there, which is having a, how do you say, a, tickling effect, a tripling effect on other as, uh, innovations as well. So we'll definitely discuss a lot about mining. So what is digitalization? And I think if, we will, if I will ask in this room for someone to describe for me digitalization, I'm sure we will not end up with the same definition. Um, it's one of those buzzwords that everyone is talking about and uses it very freely, but we don't necessarily always mean the same thing. But, so let's start with a common understanding of what is digitalization. It's, it's actually quite a bit about these enabling technologies, but that is just one part of the puzzle. It's about using these technologies with sensors, connectivity, analytics, but the way we try to define digitalization is very much about the use of digital technologies to change a business model, uh, to provide new revenue model opportunities as well as value creation opportunities in an industrial ecosystem. Very complex, but to put it simply, if you can't make money out of digital technologies, you are missing the point. You haven't really worked with digitalization uh, to a larger extent. And if you can't make your customer make money, then you're totally out of the <laughs> ball game. So it could be nice to maybe, at this particular point of time, ask you a little bit, um, what do you think are the key business challenges when you think about digitalization, taking the definition we have talked about? Could we have like two minutes? You could just talk with someone sitting beside you. If you don't have someone beside you, maybe you can talk to the one in front or behind you. Uh, and let's see if we get two, three challenges up to discuss a bit. Okay, two minutes. Oh, this... Challenges. We have forty five minutes. Shall we ask? Shall we ask? All right. So, uh, I think the room gets very noisy very quickly. <laughs> do, do we have... Uh, hello, guys. Hi. All right. So, uh, the, the room gets noisy very quickly. I, we didn't realize that <laughs> when we thought about this I think exercise. the beehive metaphor that we put up there was very accurate. <laughs> so could we have uh, someone who would like to share their insight? So one challenge that you think is high priority. Maybe someone, yeah? We have Helena who could give you the mic, yeah? Okay. Good enough. Hi, I come from the European Institute of Innovation and Technology and All we right. try to drive the digital transformation in Europe. So my opinion is that it's a, a question of mindset mm -hmm. uh, to change the mentality of people that don't realize that we are inside the digital transformation and also to find the right um, business models because mm -hmm. you cannot mm -hmm. apply the old mm -hmm. ones to something completely different. So these are the main two challenges I can think of. Yeah. Yeah. Are very interesting. Actually, people part of uh, the transformation is kind of a very integral part. And as well as, as you talk about the business model, which has many different components, is very much enabling that change and providing a direction, at least, in which the change should happen. Thank you. One more. Okay, we have a hand in the back. Who was it? Who was it? 
Hi, I'm Sudarshan. I'm from the PLM industry. All right. Yeah. The biggest challenge is that we face, especially when you talk about digitization, is redundant processes. Uh, okay. The Can processes are pretty much redundant, and there are processes that are getting enhanced in silos. Mm -hmm. And they don't kind of enable you to digitize or get the entire digital thread in place. So that becomes one of the biggest right. problems of these days. Yeah. This is very interesting. I think if I take another spin at it, I think you went quite specific with the processes. I could even talk about re employment of chief digital officer. I think we all have seen that in all the leading company side. And I think that is a clear example of someone that needs to work across, but actually doesn't kind of integrate the different mm -hmm. changes that are happening within the organization. And we have a lot of this individual initiatives on a line function that we are faced with. And that's not organizational transformation towards digitalization. So, okay, so I think we keep up with the time. Thank you for, for your insights here. Mm -hmm. Um, and if we move towards something that we have tried to a little bit talk about is that we have tried to talk about digitalization more as a trap. Um, and so we're going to present you three, uh, three traps uh, on digitalization that can be quite relevant. And I think it, they apply quite well also to what we have already been discussing. So the first one, too slow digital transformation. I think that is core to the mindset also. Um, the largest risk that we see with digitalization is that you're not doing anything, that you're not being active. And I can tell you, two, three years when we started working on this topic, we were a bit worried uh, because it was going a bit too slow in many of the large leading companies in Swedish industry. I think we're, we're better, but if you're not on the train on, on this topic, I think you're in for a fall. Uh, and clearly, all companies are facing this shift in the industry. 72% of global CEO believe that the next three years will be more critical for their industry than the last 50. So it's kind of important to be on the train. But too often it's still like, ah, it's like we're waiting for someone to take the baton and come up with this holistic solution. We, and the silos are not working together like we were talking. The processes are not aligned and you're mm -hmm. not really moving forward. So that's a very important trap. The second, development of digital solutions without understanding the customer value. And I think that this is definitely a provider-centric uh, view. If you're, and um, we have well, too much technology, too little business. We have a very strong engineering focus in many of our leading companies. But it's often that you're too enthusiastic about solving those technological problems and coming up with new applications. And maybe you're not thinking enough about what is really the key customer issues that you're trying to solve. Or what are the needs of the end user who would really use this technology in day-to-day -day operations. So I think companies are often lacking in their ability to you know, critically evaluate what is the customer really willing to pay for. Uh, Value proposition canvas is uh, definitely a good tool to start discussing this. But um, an example, actually, <laughs> from one of the companies that we're working with. So I'm sure that their system is highly advanced with a lot of functionalities. But what I'm really after and what I want to see is how does these functionalities apply to our businesses and how will, will it make it more profitable? And I think that is uh, something that providers have often failed to really address. And, and I think a uh, more informal talk was, I'm not going to pay twice the amount of money to buy the same equipment that I bought it for five years back, now just because it has digital functionalities. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is the feeling many customers can feel when you have this highly overly engineered product that <laughs> mm -hmm. you don't really want to pay for, or you don't know even how to integrate in your existing processes. Um, I think, of course, the next part is very much about selling the digital solution without the business modeling, and that is also very critical. And what we see quite often is that companies have not fully considered what would be the implication of launching these type of digital functionalities to the market. And there are a lot of hidden costs connected with as you change your business model towards a digital offering. It's not it's not something uh, that many companies have done historically, which is, you know, you have been selling products and then you have added a service contract and that is servitization. When you move towards more of this digital offering, it's a, it's a change from the root level and you need to redefine the whole product. Um, 
we have also changes on challenges on the customer side. You know, uh, we have cases of customer acting opportunistically with the digital offerings, and this has been that you know customer behavior changes as you start to offer them something totally different. Uh, delivery process is another challenge. I mean, you are guaranteeing some productivity or some outcome for three, four-year contracts. Can your delivery organization really manage that? Uh, not always that easy to be able to contemplate. Uh, Another part and maybe can, that is why you're actually not able to create this value for the customer. Mm -hmm. Cannibalization of existing business model is another example uh, that we also start to see, but uh, we're not always certain if that is a bad thing. Maybe that is a st stage of change that you need to go through maybe anyways. So let's try to zone in a little bit at the business model part, and I think that is also very interesting. Uh, so when we are starting to talk about digital business model innovation, I think we want to share with you one of the logic that is core to our project. Uh, and that is very much about trying to aim towards sustainable industry. And I mean, that is the goal we are really aiming for. And I think to a larger extent, uh, many companies, and this is something we have discussed also with many leading companies in Sweden, they could let go of many financial consideration if the goal is towards sustainability in terms of economical and social benefits, uh, environmental and social benefits. So I think that can be a nice starting conversation to motivate why not only work with digitalization, but what value it can create, a bigger value, a better value. And we think that to a larger extent, digitalization is a very important enabler for that. But which technologies, which applications, the missing piece of the puzzle is very much about a business model. How would you actually make money out of it? But I think if it is enough complication for an individual company to change their business model, what we are trying to focus on, uh, where academia is also not getting into yet to a larger extent, is a change at the ecosystem level. And I think we're going to give you more example of why that changes are happening at the ecosystem level and how they are being depicted and what implication it can have for each individual companies. Uh, so, so this is definitely something very important. So let's take this as an example. Uh, this is a case uh, where we were invited in to act as business model experts. In this particular case, in the room we had respondents from Bulidan, ABB, Ericsson, Talia, and Volvo CE, which is not part of this case. Um, and we started to talk about, let's talk about, well, one of the cases to talk about was 5G implication in mining. Um, but we wanted to zone into a specific offering that could be launched to a market, and in this case, it was about smart ventilation. Uh, so Bulidan thinks smart ventilation is a great solution. You know, for mine, 40% of their cost is ventilation. Uh, so if you could, you know, energy savings could be done quite significantly if you could regulate movement of the people. But they want only one contract. They don't want five contracts. Someone needs to orchestrate this. Who's going to do that? Which network would it get connected with? Should Ericsson only sell the base stations and Talia should manage the bandwidth? Should it be the other way around? Uh, should be there, should, there, should there be some other IoT providers? Should the product be redesigned totally because it is going to be sold as a you know, smart ventilation kind of offering? Uh, should there be other actors that needs to be considered that are not part of the discussion right now? For example, Mobilaris, who can have smart tags on individual so you could regulate the flow of humans and then the fan. Uh, and all those things are very interesting to talk about, and it's not very simple. You could easily move ABB backwards, put Ericsson here as a communication platform provider, and put in Metso, Sandwick, Epiroc, and start to think about the ecosystem. And there is where the challenging points start to emerge. One-to-one -one collaboration doesn't provide the full picture to what potential digitalization has. And I think that is what we are trying to challenge and figure out. What would be the business model for all these actors to come together and go towards a common uh, business model? Easy said than done. Um, okay, so what is really a business model? We have been talking quite a bit about it, and I guess if you're not familiar with the concept, it can be a bit confusing. So a business model defines the way an organization creates delivers and captures value. And I guess we can discuss this a bit more. So uh, what is really the unique offering? What customer needs are you addressing? And um, you know, how would you really configure these offerings? So that is core to understanding how you're really creating value. Uh, delivering value. What capabilities will you have? Uh, how will activities and, uh, be reformulated? How are you organizing your operational processes to be able to offer these? And what strategic partners do you need? 
the ecosystem case that Minute was just presenting is an excellent example to, to start to think about, okay, what do you really need in terms of uh, what partnership do you need to be able to deliver a value? And then, of course, very important part and something that uh, maybe think people think the most about when we talk about business model. How do you capture value? What would be the revenue model? How do you, are you really getting in the money? And the flip side of that, where, what are your costs? Uh, so trying to balance these, of course, are very important, and there the risk management approaches can be very important. So, um, and I guess it's important to kind of say, you know, like these are all different choices you need to put into place. So, you know, risks are not bad necessarily as long as you get paid for it. But, you know, you need to evaluate which level of risk you want to do. And if you're going with a totally new offering, with a totally new delivery organization, your risk understanding is different. And mm -hmm. I think that is something to take into mm -hmm. consideration too. So, of course, the total picture is important. It's really about creating a powerful business model where all these different elements are working together. Because if you don't have that alignment, I think, well you're going to end up losing money in some way yeah. or have a very unsatisfied customer. And we also talk about a concept we are trying to work around is value leakage. And that is, you know, so value creation, delivery, and capturing, if not aligned, leads to value leakage. And that is something to also consider in this case. So I guess we wanted to, to ask you a, a question here again. Uh, what do you think are the most challenging is issues, uh, business model issues, for profiting from digitalization? So we have left you this, um, so two minutes to discuss. I think it's okay, we have time. We have half an hour to go and you know. But the academic slides are a little bit heavier. You wanna do less of them? Okay, guys. Two minutes are up. Okay, so two minutes are up. Uh, can we can we have some uh, some thoughts, some reflections? Anybody wants to take a lead? Please just raise your hand. Okay, we have one person there. Maybe logistical challenge. <laughs> And we have a second person next to him, so that right. maybe helps in the delivery of the mic. Ah, uh, yeah. Now, when quickly picking one, I mean, we were discussing revenue model. Mm. Because, I mean, you see companies very successful uh, who still are not earning money on digital business. And uh, you have this nice factory earning money. Why should we give the digital project any? Yeah. Come with the customers first. It's a chicken and the egg situation. Yeah. So mm. that is tricky. Mm. Mm. Right, we have Wolf. Uh, sorry, oh no, one moment, please. I think this is super exciting. I'm Ulf Lander from Innova. 
I think that short term it will be like the Solov's paradox and how to make business and all this technology, namely the creation of value. But I think that long term, and that may not be so very long, will be the capture. Because I think that it may take more and more money in order to orchestrate the machine, and who's going to do that? Mm -hmm. And the one who's orchestrating the machine is the one who's going to capture the value. Uh, because when the machine gets more and more collaborative and more and more efficient, then it also will be a case of who's going to be left over and who's going to get the margins. I think it's a very <laughs> rich reflection there. <laughs> uh, because I think, but, but it is interesting. Ah, I think we have one more, Helena. Uh, maybe this is the last one. But, but I think it is interesting. If the revenue model, uh, to kind of con go back to that, is to be shared between multiple actors and the whole architecture of a, what is a product is not anymore the same. Uh, I think that is going to be very interesting, which maybe this doesn't really capture that easily uh, because you're talking about multi-layered business model uh, and the linkages between who creating value and how you're capturing the value. Uh, yeah, one thing I saw, saw in that model you showed is that a lot of companies are staying uh, in the old type of, of uh, structure, how to build with all the connections you had on the, this on that, and you, a lot of th times you shouldn't stay in the old model. I'm yes. working with IT and security, so I've seen this. That, that, that that's you have to learn the cu learn the customer how to change their way of thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, when you say old system, you mean an old business model? Uh, of, or you have to. Say the the connection between different parts uh, of the, the business model. Technological system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that and is that's also that's connected with the business model. Mm. Mm. Uh. I think this is also yeah. very important. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Last then. <laughs> I just have a question when it comes to capturing value mm. and reflection to your sustainable business uh, perspective. Because if you take capturing va value and the things that sense and why is not showing the, uh, the sustainability perspective. Could you reflect on that? Sustainability in this particular context that you are talking about is from the point of economical, social, and or is it sustainability in terms of long-term competitiveness? Ah, perfect. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, that is, uh, that is actually an interesting part to be starting to put value on it uh, and, and to even start to talk about uh, how that is going to be maybe the way you're going to communicate what value you are generating and how you're capturing it. Uh, so to, to give you an example of that, I think what is becoming very obvious, and I think that is the part I was trying to touch also on, I think many customers are becoming aware of that when they are trying to procure new kind of services, the value given on economical benefits compared to societal benefits mm. in terms of safety regulations mm. to, or towards energy, you know, energy saving or some other parts of it, I think they, they are starting to be integrated mm. part of discussion mm. in a business model. Not only on revenue model, because it's not isolated entity. It is all connected throughout <laughs> different mm. elements too. And I think so from that point of view, the timing is good if, mm. if you can start to have that dialogue. So I think I can give also a practical example. We were, just this morning, we were talking with the procurement officer at uh, Bo Liden, And he is basically, he's quite open to say that if you can come up with a solution that, you know, allows us to have lower accidents, save lives, basically. You know, the money that you can get for that solution is unlimited. There's a big pile of money waiting for those who can show case that they can offer that value, that they can save lives. Because... These are very important issues for many, many companies. Great. Uh, okay, so I guess we wanted to exemplify some of the challenges and also some of the solutions that we have seen from industry. Um, so starting with value creation, I guess a, a key question here is, okay, so how do you really leverage these di digital technologies to enable higher value creation for your customers? Uh, so we have an example here of a, a quarry, uh, and I, you know, it's quite a messy picture. There's a lot of different yellow and blue machines. It's a mixed fleet, uh, and 
Quarries are maybe not the most sophisticated part of the industry right now. They are still doing many of their operational plannings on pen and paper. And so it's uh, not the most sophisticated in terms of digitalization. But of course, we have many providers in Sweden that are addressing these industries and are trying to come up with solutions. They have been having connected machines for the last 10 years. They have been collecting a lot of data on how these yellow and blue machines are performing. And they're trying to come up with ways of optimizing the operations for the customer. But really getting that to stick and convincing the customer that they want to buy this has not been that easy. So what do they do? Well, one thing that we have seen is definitely that they're starting to work with more of a microservice approach. So they are working together with the customer in a stepwise fashion to identify all of the problems that you can see in these sites. And believe me, there's a lot of problems and issues that can be resolved, sometimes quite easily. But of course, then it's, you, you can't solve all of them at once. And if you try to do that, you're not going to get anywhere because uh, it just takes too much time. So you need to prioritize. And, and that is uh, what we've seen. So in this case, for example, we found that um, the uh, trucks that were going out of the quarry had they, they weren't really being loaded correctly because the drivers were getting fines if, if the truck would be overloaded. They would systematically underload the truck instead. Uh, so they would always go there with like 95% fill. And maybe you don't believe that that is a problem, but if you start to think about it, truck after truck, day after day, continuous operation throughout the whole year, it's a lot of money that is being wasted on fuel also in congestion at the site because there's just too many trucks. So just by making sure that they put in a weight measuring system on these trucks and, and could see that, okay, 100% capacity, exactly what we want, uh, they were able to create a lot of benefits at this specific price. So, so that was a, just a, a first step, uh, but where you are working together with the customers, really trying to identify the problems and then uh, coming up with a, a concrete solution. Uh, and then you can continue to the next problem and do multiple of these agile cycles together. And really, what are you doing? Well, you're building trust. You're showing that you have these digital capabilities, that you can create value for the customer. Uh, and you're also, of course, building your own uh, service portfolio. So st in a stepwise fa fashion, you can build a much more advanced service portfolio and add much more uh, value for the customers and, and ultimately create some revenue growth. Let's move to the next example of value delivery. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, it's a forest equipment provider who's trying to sell preventive maintenance contract. And then the challenge tends to be that the delivery organization, so in this particular case, you can think about the service point uh, dealership, is not skilled enough to use the digital offering uh, that backend is trying to sell. So what we see in this particular case, uh, without taking names, <laughs> on the customer side, last large forest owner, and on the provider side, a leading forest equipment provider, they had an agreement towards that all the contractors in the forest, of, uh, forest uh, operations of the customer would use these machines, uh, these particular machines with a higher contract. And the middle management agreed, but when it comes to operators, which is these entrepreneurs, and when it comes to the service organization, the link was extremely weak when it comes to using digitalization. And what is a very big challenge that many companies are facing right now is how do you take away heterogeneity from your delivery organization? So at a simplistic level, this could be about your dis de de uh, dis uh, how do you say, dealership throughout Sweden. On a more complex level, you can say this is your distribution challenge throughout, you throughout the world. And just think about the variations of competences you can have at a simplistic level and a more complex level, regulations, government policy, market readiness. So what we are starting to see is a concept of smart workshops where the back end, which is the manufacturers of the equipment, is trying to sell more of these preventive uh, solutions with the equipment sale and using telematics as a baseline to increase the capability of the delivery organization. So deciding how many decisions can you take out from the delivery organization to make it more heterogeneous or homogeneous in some service level quality and to be able to use these digital solutions. So this is one example of how you can optimize your delivery solution or delivery channel uh, through digitalization.
Okay, so we're going to talk about the exciting stuff, value capturing. Um, so I think this is a very common problem that you see. You know, many companies are starting to have quite sophisticated um, systems for analytics and AI that can really allow you to optimize uh, a customer's process and, and you know, create a lot of value. Uh, it could be reduction of operating cost by 10% on a particular piece of equipment or unit operation. So, and if it's a large, if it's a process industry, for example, you know, that can be, a, yeah, it's many hundreds of millions even. But how do you ensure a fair distribution of the gains from such a solution? That is not that easy because typically the business model would be that this provider would be paid like a consultant maybe. Okay, they come in, they do the hours, they solve the problem, and, and they bill for the hours that they were there. But, you know, that is not very attractive. And that is not really, then they're not getting paid for all the capability that they have built up on the back end. So it's interesting to, to discuss, okay, how, how can we really short? Because definitely the customer won't be willing to, you know, split the 50-50. <laughs> then, then it also starts to be quite difficult. So what we're seeing is that companies are opting more for also some, something we could call relational contracting. So not really thinking so much about what's in it for me, but what's in it for we. Uh, focusing on how you can create better um, value for the customer, lower costs, and so on. But also this better business for the supplier. Uh, so there are a few principles uh, that apply in this type of contracting. So one is focusing on the results, not on the single transaction. So you want to have a longer engagement and see, okay, so how can we create more value together in the long term, not, not just in this specific business deal and trying to squeeze each other. Focus on the what, not the how. So don't need to be so stuck up on exactly what is the solution. Try to understand what is it really that we need to achieve, and, and then a lot will solve itself. So of course, you need to be quite clear and try to define, okay, what, are, what would be acceptable outcomes for this? Uh, what, what are we re really looking to achieve? And those KPIs are not always the obvious ones. You could think about a cost per ton contract. You can think about availability-based contract. You can think about uptime based. You know, what is the best mix that you would like to go for in this relational engagement? And that would vary depending upon what engagement you're trying to define between each other. Uh, Pricing model? A pricing model that creates incentives for both parties yeah. to be working actively together to optimize the business. Um, so definitely this cost per ton can be a very interesting, you know, the more, the more material you are able to move, the more money uh, the provider uh, makes, but also the customer, of course, because they are, have a much more efficient operation. To maybe add to that, so we do have, uh, you know, outcome-based contracts. I think one good example for that, which has been since 1980s, is Metso's life cycle contract with Bulidan in mill lining, which is cost per ton contract. If Metso makes money, Bulidan makes money. If Bulidan makes money, Metso makes money. Excellent. Everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. <laughs> but it's, what is the next level after that? What could you do more? What could you optimize even more to have flexibility? For example, if the market changes, and there is a need for higher productivity, then how could you have room to manage that in the existing contracts? And that is where this governance part kicks in to actually also define that, of this continuous innovation way of thinking, which is not only based on one transaction and one contract being sold. Uh, and that is the whole idea of this relational contracting, which takes a holistic view on the relationship, which is beyond a specific contract. So let's try to zoom out a little bit. Uh, now we have talked about digitalization traps. We have talked about specific elements of business model. We have given you some insights on what can work to address these challenges. But let's try to take some broad strokes. You know, what is the future business models? Um, and if these are threats or opportunities, very much depends on what kind of person you are. No, I'm joking. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's one you would so say that it's about if you see a glass half empty or half full. But I, I, don't, I think it's much more complex than that, of course. One of the challenges tends to be very much about identifying which digital opportunity you want to explore. And I think this is not obviously always very clear. So if you take the example of uh, what David was talking about, that you see many possibilities to improve customer's operation, but which opportunity you want to really go and explore? Well, 
one problem is that you have limited resources, so you can't explore all opportunities. And then the second one is that you need scalability. So what we think is to a larger extent, companies need to work with not a complete solution, but more of this agile way of working, iterative way of working. And that is not always very easy because you also need to think about the other parts, that your business model, the digital business model, would be connected with other existing business model in your overall organization. So we are actually talking not only about a multiple business model internally within the company, but also externally towards other factors that they need to coordinate. And that starts to get super complex. And one business model making money could have possibly revenue losses on the other one. Uh, and how do you take that transition then? It's not a very simple answer. You can't really stop your operation and just introduce a new business model and hope for that one to take the whole revenue and the organization will change. And, and I think this is, this is a big challenge many companies are struggling with, the cannibalization of the business model. Okay, so taking yet another step back, actually. So where do we really get competitiveness from? Um, so for a long time, we were talking so much about product innovation. And of course, you know, we have a strong industry in that. We have quite leading capabilities. But you know, for quite some time, that has not been enough because the competition has, is increasing. And um, I don't know if we have that big advantage anymore. So we're then we're trying to focus on service innovation and servitization, uh, really trying to add more value to the customer's operation and creating these relationships over time. Um, but that has been a bit of a struggle too. We have mixed results, definitely. Uh, many companies have succeeded, but many have also seen that, okay, we're not profiting that well from it. So maybe we believe that digitalization can be an enabler, and everybody's talking about that now, that uh, that would be <laughs> the true way that we can uh, generate these values. So we're talking about smart products. So, but it, it's critical here to not forget about the earlier parts. The product is still very much core uh, to, to how we will compete. It's just that we need to add on the service layer and the digital layer that kind of makes it all go together. But then there's some com complexities happening because technology is shifting. The product is not the same anymore. Uh, a lot of our Swedish companies are facing these three quite paramount shifts. So, from the combustion engine, we're going to electrified vehicles. Soon, they will be autonomous. We have testing of autonomous trucks, autonomous buses, autonomous ships. And uh, definitely in the mining sector, there is already operational uh, autonomous uh, mining equipment. And then, of course, we're doing this with the connectivity. So what is really happening? If you look at the truck manufacturers, you know, 40% of their value creation used to be from the engine and from the powertrain. But when you go into electrification, then what, what is left? 20% um, from the cabin, maybe. And maybe you won't even need a cabin. So what is really going to happen here um, when, we, when the trucks start looking like this? So no engine, no cabin, very Scania and very Volvo trucks in this scenario. So you really need to think about, okay, so how are we going to, you know, make up for those 60% of all the value we've been creating? And how are we going to transform the organization to be able to create that value? Okay, so to the last bold strokes then. Uh, let's think about mine automation, and let's put Boliden there as an example. This is critical for Boliden's future competitiveness. If you think about a mine running in north of Sweden where you need to go deeper and deeper to get extraction of the material, uh, expensive labor costs, uh, you know, high demands on the machines, uh, pure time it takes to actually transport people up and down. Uh, mine automation could actually easily mean for them to operate four shifts in a, year, in a, in a day compared to two. Think about the productivity gains you could have. Um, and then you think about who are supplying to them. All hypothetical cases, right, guys? So, uh, and, and then you have a challenge of that. To a larger extent, when we are talking about digitalization, it's a, it's a scenario where you have mixed fleets. 
and many actors need to come together and contribute towards some kind of what we are simplistically calling an integration layer or a digital platform. This is a talk we have had a lot, you know. So what everyone is, of course, thinking about, who is going to be active in this digital player? Because what David just talked about is that if the product looks very different from the core, uh, whoever is there is going to make a lot of money, and it's going to have much more attractive value proposition towards the customer. So the scenario number one that is happening right now is that everyone is trying to do it. Everyone wants to be there. Uh, so you have everything from, uh, you know, digital offering everyone is trying to have, individual ones, everyone wants a share of that. The problem for Bullethan from this particular case could be that it's a lock-in effect. If they buy one equipment provider's system to do a fleet management for simplistic reasons, let's, let's take that. Um, and I think what could also be a challenge is that they could the product categories can vary quite a bit. You know, so you have a better driller from a company and a better transportation material from a company and a better another product from a company. So it's not that simple case scenario. So I don't think this is going to play out that simply. The other case scenario which is happening right now, I think, is to a larger extent that the customers are just fed up with waiting for any provider to come with an open solution, not a closed one that only sells their offering. So they are trying to make their own. Uh, digital platform. Not also very smart idea. <laughs> uh, I think I had a discussion with a uh, leading uh, equipment, not equipment provider, but a data solution provider to mining, and they thought that if customers will take that journey, by the time the digital solution is launched, it would already be outdated. Uh, c coming back to your suggestions on, you know, legacy problems to, you know, buying into something that, are, that is not their core competitiveness. Of course, we can always lean back to the the strong guys who manage the system anyway. So, you know, in most mines, you would have an ABB or Siemens control system. That is the backbone of data flow towards maintenance or something like that, to a large extent. They could definitely have a role here. Um, is that good? Do they have enough product knowledge to be able to cope with that? Maybe, maybe not. You could also think about new entrants like Mobilaris or new track small companies. What do they bring to the table? Well, exclusivity and really trying to work with open platforms because they don't have a product heritage. They don't need to worry about selling the product and generating revenue from that. That could happen, but uh, it can have its own challenges too. And I think my favorite one is these guys. Uh, and if they start to decide to go in this direction, you know, I think we have a, we have a quite beautiful scenario of... Uh, well, maybe some kind of a discussion or negotiations between multiple actors that are trying to go for this integration layer. And maybe there is scenario X that we are not referring to. What we also want to highlight here is the fact that uh, already now there are ecosystems competing with ecosystems. To give you an example, Sandvik Mining collaborates very closely with IBM Watson and uh, Newtrax, a Canadian company, to go towards automated solution. Epiroc is collaborating to a larger extent with Mobilaris, where they have a majority share, and with X Digital Player to go towards certain solutions. So they are kind of going towards different setups, and I think it's going to be interesting how this is going to roll out. Um, so that is something to think about as well when we start to think about digital business modeling and multiple actors that need to collaborate. We were going to have a question here, but I think we need to just push through because we have limited time uh, towards if there is a scenario that we are missing. I think one cool scenario I can already talk about is that in certain Canadian mines, we are talking about more open platforms where it would be more or less the idea of that whoever is the most competitive would have the ownership uh, or would have the opportunity to come up with the integrated solution. Uh, but I think it's, they are experimenting with this, where they are asking all their suppliers to actually have an open platform. Um, we just heard about a contract being signed between um, a mining, Swedish mining company and an equipment provider, and the reason they were chosen was because they were going for a more open platform rather than a closed platform that maximized their lock-in effect. So that played in, in competition to another equipment provider that is also very, very strong and maybe had a better offering. Uh, okay, so moving towards some academic frameworks. Um, we have four frameworks that we would like to discuss with you that kind of brings everything together. Um, let's, yeah. Um, okay, so the, the first one actually uh, is all about people 
and how you manage this inertia and the mindset within organizations. Because when you see all these shifts, both on the technological side and on the business side, I think there is bound to create quite a bit of organizational resistance. Uh, people are scared. Uh, people who are sitting there with strong competences in combustion engines, you know, they are not that happy that all of a sudden the electric department is trying to get more funds and trying to uh, basically replace their competence. We have seen the same with, with digital. Many of the companies still have a lot large staff that was more focusing on, on kind of the analog control systems and uh, the traditional way of working. So it's maybe not that easy if you are this guy or girl in the middle who has this bright idea, we really want to push for digitalization or we see that, okay, the future lies in auto automated equipment and that there is where we can really create value for our customers. So what do you really do? How does individuals who are trying to drive innovation in their companies, how do, you, do they do it? Um, we did a study uh, recently uh, with one of our PhD candidates uh, looking into this and we found some different strategies that they are applying. So the first one, of course, is evangelizing. So basically going around the company preaching, you know, really trying to sell it to all possible actors. And this is uh, something that we could see. Well, definitely this is what top management is often trying to do, trying to get the organization to move. But also in the middle management, we could see certain ones that maybe from a bit from left field, but was really trying to to steer their organization in the right direction. Um, but of course, um, it's not all that have that capability and, and are maybe interested to, to work like a preacher. Uh, many are more engineers who believe in the technology and just want to do things. So what you do, you do then. Well, bootlegging or skunk works, you just try to find some way to do your project, maybe on some other project's budget or borrowing in some resources from somebody else, so quite covertly and without authorization. And well, <laughs> I was talking to a senior manager about this, and he said that, okay, so yeah, I guess I shouldn't really condone this when my employees <laughs> do this, but I, <laughs> I, I have learned that you know, the best way to keep the organization going and for us to be innovative is to actually be a bit lenient and look the other way. Let them uh, take some money out of the... <laughs> some other initiatives. So I think many of the brightest ideas actually come out from this type of, I think, um, yeah, we shouldn't go into too many details when we're late in the presentation. Um, the third strategy, uh, collaborating. So really trying to find the right stakeholders in the organization which you can align to and, and get on the table. There are certain, there are always these wise guys or that, that has a lot of legitimacy that if, if you get that person on board, then all of a sudden door starts opening for your initiatives. And I think that is also a very important strategy. And that is maybe not something that these engineering types are always that used to. So, but it's, it's very important that you try to understand how can you navigate this organizational system. Um, and of course, uh, finally, uh, we're working quite a bit with leveraging and trying to capitalize on existing resources from maybe some some other program or something that is going on and just trying to get them hooked on, on your ID too, bringing it into to another project. Okay, so another one. Um, I just noticed that it's four already now, so we should have been ending. Uh, we have two more, three more frameworks to go, but we'll try to be a little bit quick uh, with, with this particular one at least. Uh, so one of the challenge uh, with the, this is more around the process innovation. And I think one of the challenge we start to see when working with digital offerings, so let's say an outcome-based contract with a strong digital component is that you need to work with value creation and value capturing simultaneously in a, it, in, it, how do you say, iterative way. And this has to kind of go through different developmental cycles. So what we have here are like three developmental cycles which have components of value creation and value capturing that you are trying to redefine over time. And this is actually very complex, but I think to a larger extent enables you to negotiate and work in an agile way. So to give you an understanding towards the first one then, here the idea could be very much about trying to really assess what opportunity is that we want to develop and coming up with a concept on a value creation level then. But then to also get a for ca value capturing part to focus on Cap capturing the stakeholders' insights into this as well, or maybe coming up with an agreement that would enable this. 
if you don't have, and this is something we have seen in many, on those high cases where you're going for outcome-based contracts, if you don't have commitment of the top management and the focus is on cost, probably not the right relationship where you should engage in this dialogue. Uh, so aligning objective is very, very critical. Going towards the design part, here the things start to get a little bit more concrete. Here you're trying to negotiate you know, everything from what should be the risks you want to take, you know, from the value capturing part, what should be the KPIs you want to use. Uh, also from the development part, you know, what agreements do you want to achieve in terms of responsibilities you would like to do, what tasks you would like to be delivered. And I think this is very much also about formulating value creation processes and constructing value capturing mechanisms. Uh, an agreement may or may not be signed at this particular science, but if you sign this agreement, then you're going ahead. And that kicks in the delivery phase, which is a long phase. This is the phase that runs over four years, five years, depending upon the contracted duration. And here, I think what we see is this, that you need to incentivize this continuous innovation thinking. And that would actually mean, to a larger extent, from a company point of view, to design... Um, so from a creation point of view, the provider needs to think about how can they increase the capability of the customer to be able to maximize the utility of the equipment. How do they kind of create op frameworks for that you can renegotiate new offerings. And I think these all also play into it to be very important. So this is kind of a way of what we think is like an interplay between value creation, value capturing over a development cycle um, is something that we have also tried to work with. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about technology also, or how, does, uh, how can you apply technology to ensure um, value delivery. Um, so one thing that we have definitely seen, and this is common across all companies more or less, that you're trying to implement some kind of digital platform architecture. And what's important here is maybe that the information module or these uh, um, platforms where you can actually store data and connect all the different equipment is actually at the core of many of these offerings. Uh, so product modules can change, you can have different types of equipment and everything. Services can also be a bit different, but the information layer stays the same. And that actually enables much more scalability and, and customization opportunities. So we're starting then to see that for the backend R&D and um, uh, business development organization, it's very much about orchestrating these platforms and on the other hand, then, for the front end, for the delivery units, the sales uh, parts, the service points that Vinit has been talking about, it's a lot about offering builder and also in, uh, keeping this running. So I'm going to zoom in now quite a bit on the offering delivery part because I think that is a, is a key challenge that we see uh, and that we have also discussed in this paper. Um, so what you can really do with <laughs> using this type of platform is First of all, from the, from the back end, really trying to develop more applications for analyzing the customer's usage to create a better delivery support. Um, so from providing the tools for the front end to be able to, to, to really offer more value. Um, you're also working much more to identify best practices and see, okay, so this smart workshop that Vinet was talking about, how, how does that really work? Do we have any good cases in, in our delivery network. Uh, we had w one company that they had extremely good delivery organization in the Netherlands. And of course, you're trying to learn then how are they doing it? How are they setting up their processes? And trying to instill that into some digital tools that can be used by um, other uh, delivery units. For the front end, of course, it's very important that you're actually utilizing this platform to, to really, and, and thinking constructively up, okay, how can we really use the data, the insight that, that we're getting about how our customers use the equipment? How can we use that to, to create more value, to create more efficient uh, processes? And also following this up regularly, so you know that, okay, so this customer's machine is about to break, so maybe we should already start loading the van so we can go out and, and, and help them. So that is definitely a, a way for companies to ensure much more profitable and uh, better value creation for the customers. And to a larger extent, it is about trying to match this twin goal of efficiency and customization. And that's a difficult combination to achieve, of course. Uh, we have one more framework, but we're going to skip it. This was a little bit more about you know, partnering, how do you can work with partners, how you move from con con contractual to transactional to relational, and how data could be an enabler and what relational specific assets you need to also play into the consideration here. Um, 
so to the takeaways. Um, well, I think to put it very simply, uh, successful digitalization is a more complex than it may be. It's not only about technology. Uh, and as companies are starting to work with different uh, digital opportunities, I think an important part is to very much think about the business model. And we think there are four key pillars that they need to think around. Process, people, technology, and partnering. Uh, and that is what we think would lead to a successful digitalization. So mm -hmm. as you start to explore digital opportunities in your environment, uh, I think it's really important to involve your ecosystem actors and start to collaborate. So that would be maybe our last tagline to leave the presentation at. Thank you so much. So we have 15 minutes for yes. some questions. Just raise your hands. We have one on the back there. Uh, I wanted to understand uh, from you about uh, intellectual property transfer. That is, uh, especially when defense companies, when they sell to countries, there are some countries who have agreements, you know, they need to have offset agreements with local manufacturers to manufacture certain components. So when you talk about the digital ecosystem, it becomes extremely difficult for the OEMs to collaborate with the joint ventures or the local enablers. Mm. So are there any strategies that you see apart from having, having a digital platform? Because most of the components are either ITAR or or in fact, very intellectual, it's, a, it's an intellectual property of the organization, yeah. which they would never want to part with. So what would be the... Yeah, that's a difficult question. And I think, you know, our competence maybe doesn't really go into defense industry as such. Uh, but to take a more simplistic uh, view on it, what you are actually talking about is market regulatory uh, you know, settings that can vary between countries and you're trying to offer, let's say, digital solutions globally, right? Um, and if you take that stance, which is simplistic than the defense uh, one that you are talking about, um, I, I think we have, uh, what we have seen is this, that the companies are trying to take this in a stepwise way, so they are trying to identify the sweet spots where it makes sense to do the global rollout towards more offering this digital solution. The first one's, of course, going to be the open markets, but sometimes we have also seen, like, geographical um, or, you know, it can be strange things that can trigger why a market becomes interesting. To give you an example, um, so that would be a good example of a barrier <laughs> to a market entry, and you would probably not like to go there uh, if that is not part of your strategy or, you know, it's a very Im important customer. But, like, um, what made Netherlands very interesting for one of the yellow equipment providers is that it's a small country. You can really regulate a whole delivery organization to offer digital solution with outcome contracts much more easily. You know, and, and that was very efficient. And as they digitalized their delivery organization too, to work with iPads and you know, kind of have this um, information to do preventive maintenance, it worked out. Pick that example and then you go to UAE, where bigger area, but very uh, cheaper skilled resources. And then suddenly, the business model also made sense. So I think companies are playing around with different strategies as they are going towards global market. And it may not only be digital, digitally enabled in many mm. cases, uh, but it has an important role to play regardless. But then, of course, same company again, trying to go to Nigeria. Very stupid thing happens. They can't get SIM cards into the machine. <laughs> they, they, they can't connect them anymore, so they, they don't have the data anymore. And also, contracts are not highly, how do you say, <laughs> appreciated in a Nigerian setting. So it was difficult to bind them for three, four-year contracts. You know? So I think so this market dynamics is actually a very interesting part of trying to go global and offering digital mm -hmm. solutions. And I think that is something to look into more specifically. Thank you. Uh, one thing. I, I hadn't seen you place in the ecosystem of, of these solutions and that's not even if it's military it's even this it's the same um, need f for for a private business and that's the information security and how to keep the information uh, not leaking out and uh, uh, we have seen too many examples of this in Sweden the last year uh, for other things that's digitalization in, in another, other types of business. Mm. But you haven't put in that in, in uh, the business model because 
in some ways, some solutions you have to have a cost, and some, in some solutions there is implemented already from the beginning. But mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say, it's very few that is impl implemented from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, that's an important challenge too. Uh, and, and I think maybe it's purely because our competence doesn't really go in that direction to a larger extent. But you know, I think we have seen some trends related with not necessarily IT systems or like uh, you know, data security, but customers' readiness to actually adapt technology. So I think maybe three years back, I think cloud computing was like very hot. And I think many <laughs> providers thought about, well, it is still. But you know, if you take industrial applications, many providers thought they could actually push in the customers to go for cloud solutions. And that can actually enable them to a larger extent to work remotely to allow, you know, with many applications. But that has not been highly successful. I think many customers have shown quite strong resistance towards those kind of innovative solutions. And that's almost like first level of some kind of tech system integration thinking. So, so I think, you know, uh, I think we definitely see threat from that, but also customer readiness towards data and the, you know, who owns it and how much they want to use, let others use it. Uh, I think the most progressive customers, and I think this is definitely true for like Boolean's case, when they are thinking about mine automation, they are very open about that the data needs to flow freely and they are willing to share it with their suppliers uh, to a larger extent uh, as long as it kind of delivers productivity gains to them. And I think that is kind of a progressive thinking you need to have to a larger extent to make the change. But there is a lot of resistance towards more of this you know, technological solution that either gives you, kind of makes you away from your data sources or makes it being somewhere that you're not sa feeling safe enough. Um, just a short thing. I think all these cloud, big clouds are a security risk. And just a correction, Nigeria, people have SIM cards all over. The whole economy is based on SIM cards yeah. no. <laughs> for private economy. Yeah. No, I don't remember exactly what it was, but they, they couldn't get the SIM card to put in the machine. Uh. Hi, uh, thank you for a, a great presentation. Uh, thank you. This, obviously, as, as you've spoken about, requires a lot of, a big amount of change in, in across organizations and uh, also requires big decisions on senior management and even maybe board level. Yeah. Have you seen uh, any specific competencies or, or capabilities at, in the companies that are succeeding in relation to them, to, to companies that are not doing so well in transformation on, on, the, on competencies and capabilities on senior, senior level. Mm -hmm. We haven't specifically focused on like the TMT uh, kind of a view, um, but maybe to take it from another perspective. So then, you know, which are the companies that are being progressive towards the change? Um, and then the top management's views around it. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Mm. Mm. That's, you can definitely see that certain individuals have this more open and... Um, yeah, the, it tends to, to drive. It's a totally different vibe. Also when you talk to, to their suppliers, for example, uh, how is it to interact with this when, when you have... Uh, People will have this more progressive thinking for the future and, and really think about, okay, the world is going to change, but where, how, how will our company really look like in five years? It's not going to be the same. So maybe one example that comes to my mind, uh, and this is maybe a top management strategy, but it could almost be an organizational culture. Um, and I think that there are organizations that are more open to experiments and enabling supplier-driven innovation. And I think those companies, um, I definitely would say Bulidan would qualify for someone like that, uh, an organization like that. I think they would have a, how do you say, head start to many solutions and also failures, but you know, learnings. Uh, because one, let's say a wheel loader tested in a mine and being failed could still be used as a learning for a rock driller, you know. So there is a scalability here mm -hmm. that is happening. And I think also suppliers to a larger extent are looking for customers that are progressive and opening their boundaries. Um, what we see, for example, in LKB right now is that they are having a big project called SUM, which is supposed to be like a collaboration, which is a collaboration between LKB, Epiroc, uh, ABB, Combitech, uh, Volvo, 
trucks uh, mm. in this particular case, and they're trying to create like an experimental mine where the idea would be that they work closely with providers to not only learn better how to mine, but also enable early adaptation of technologies. So I don't know if it is a TMT initiative as such, or you know, like a like just uh, it could be need driven as well, of course, <laughs> that, that they need this kind of uh, technological test. But I think so this would be an experimental mine. And I think that is very interesting because if you think from a customer point of view, a small customer in this case, in a mining scenario, uh, if a company comes to your environment and builds something, uh, they're going to, of course, scale it up, right? So that particular engagement, which is this experimental engagement, how should you value that? Uh, how should you price that collaboration? I think it's also very interesting. And I think this relational contracting is something that could help in this kind of a thinking. Um, so I think we, we are more seeing maybe organizational cultural variations mm -hmm. than individual top level initiatives. Um, yeah. Yeah, we have time with one more question, okay. right? <laughs> a short one. Yes. Uh, relational contracting uh, and. Uh an interesting concept. Do you see this in the future as being international or within within Sweden? I mean, when mm -hmm. a Swedish company uh, cooperates, is it likely to be with a foreign company or with another Swedish company? Yeah. I think it has become... Hmm. So there are variants of relational contractings that will kick in. And I think we just learned about two, uh, <laughs> clearly. So this is a new topic for us too, but we see there is a lot of traction on this, which is, you know, um, going back to mining again. Uh, for many mine operators, if they will think about top five suppliers, they can count it in their hand, and that hasn't changed in the last 20, 30 years. You know, so you have ABB, you have Epiroc, you have Sandwick, you have Autotech maybe, and you have Metso. You know, I think these have been there for a long time. They're highly skilled, leading companies. And what we think is the interesting part is that one variant of relational contracting seems to be about strategic partnership with existing players that you have existing relationship with me. So that could be within Sweden or it could be global players, but you know, uh, I don't know how you would define ABB, if it's a Swedish company or a Swiss company or a Finnish company, you know. So, but anyways, there is a, there is a lot of heritage and relationship that happens. But uh, another variant of relation contracting that we just learned today morning uh, was the engagement between an equipment provider that was going to be a new equipment provider for a mining company. And the variant that they used was, which I think is very interesting too, is that they focused on the cost and the value to start off with, very hard transactional logic. But then once that was settled, how it would be delivered and what would be the relational engagement, that was relational contracting. I don't know if I'm making any sense. So you zoned in transactionally, meaning you made two compete against each other, so you define the focus of what would be the pricing model, you know, what is the product really going to be, but then you opened up to the relational part, and that was the relational part where the company that was more open won over the one that wanted to play close to the heart, the, the, the digital solution. So, so that, that is another variant of a relational contracting that we see in. But I think this co-development part of things will kick in more and more. I think it's obviously clear that you need to have that logic when you're working with digital solutions. You can't come with one solution and that's going to just play out as you planned because there is so much iteration and learning and development happening over time uh, that you need to play, take into consideration and incentivize supplier to also work with that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vinit and David, for an interesting lecture. Uh, we, Esprit supports uh, School in the Box, which is another way and a very important way to support knowledge. So uh, we also like recycling, so they get one bowl in recycled glass from Torstensson Art. So, Thank you very much. Uh, Vinit, could you please help me to find the backdrop for Nytt and Nyttigt? Yeah, it, it, not the slideshow, the other one. Please stay put for a few more minutes, if I may ask you, because yeah. we're going to hand out the awards for the best dissertations in innovation at the Swedish yes, universities. Yes, exactly. So, and then we're going to have coffee and mingle. So Yes. We're not finished yet. A few more minutes. It's time for the award ceremony of the thesis competition Nytt och Nyttigt. So please welcome on the stage 
with a warm applause, Simon Eriksson, Carl Magnus Lunner, Sofie Persson and Emily Warman. Uh, Esprits Managing Director Magnus Aronsson and Director Ann Lidgard from Vinova will announce the winners. So please come up on the stage, Magnus and Ann. Now it's on. So, uh, thank you, Helene. Thank you very much. And uh, very welcome to this ending of this lecture. Uh, before the Mingle Networking, uh, we have the pleasure uh, to have the award ceremony for the student thesis competition, Nytt och Nyttigt, that is organized by Espri and Vinova. And uh, this is the ninth year that we're handing out this uh, award. And uh, together with us, uh, Helene said, and Lee Gard from Vinova, uh, I have the pleasure to announce the winners this year. Uh, through this competition, Esprim would almost encourage students at the universities writing the bachelor master thesis is to focus on writing about different things about innovation and commercialization. And this year, we had 69 contributions to this competition. And always, the jury had a, quite a hard job to select the winners. But we have today here the third, the most sort of three excellent uh, theses. And they will receive a travel grant up to a total of 65,000 Swedish crowns to further increase their knowledge about innovation um, after they have won this. So, once again, congratulations on having written the top three th innovation theses. And um, we just want you to, ha uh, to e before we hand out the award, to learn a little bit more about uh, what you've written about. So. Yes, uh, absolutely. This is really exciting. So uh, let me start with uh, Carl Magnus and Emily from uh, KTH. So uh, the name of your thesis is uh, Introducing Innovation Readiness Levels, a Framework to Evaluate Innovation Efforts. That's quite an ambitious uh, project. Uh, <laughs> so uh, just, could you just share with us some, what were the main findings? What, what, what are the conclusions? What can we you know, take with us from, from your thesis? Well, uh, basically, we try to develop. Oh, sorry. So basically, we try to develop a tool to. Oh, sorry. So we de try to develop a tool to evaluate uh, the innovation process. So this tool is uh, made to ease communication between different business areas, uh, and also help to to uh, measure the innovation progress. Yeah, and we started by looking at what NASA calls the TRLs that a lot of companies use today. And it's a nine-step uh, framework to measure how far you've come with the technology development. We figured that technology is only one part of innovation, and we wanted to look at business and user as well. So we looked at those three different aspects, and we applied those to uh, the company Husqvarna Group, who runs the brands Husqvarna and Gardena, among others. Uh, and uh, we ended up with uh, three different uh, frameworks, all nine steps, all mimicking the technology readiness level framework that's already well adopted. And uh, I think we got some really great results, and together we call this the innovation readiness level framework. And for those who are interested in learning more, how can we, where can we download your thesis now? How can we find it? How can we study uh, it at Vinova? Uh, if you Google innovation readiness levels, you should be able to find it. It's available on Diva. Okay, everybody made a note of this? Great. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much. And then, Sophie, you've written the thesis, Big Data Within, within Innovation Process, a quantitative study of Fortune 200 global companies. Yes. What are your most important findings? Um, well, first and foremost, uh, it was really interesting to actually study these businesses because they're a little bit difficult to get a hold of. Um, but what I came to find was that, first and foremost, they're more interested in knowing actually what we're doing online rather than what we're expressing. So the companies tend to be more interested in, uh, in investing in ways to understand how we use their products rather than the feedback that we actually state about the products. And secondly, the companies that did use big data whatsoever were actually managed to adopt it to a better degree. They actually saw that their innovation processes were both quicker than their main competition while at the same time uh, manage to generate more customer value. Thank you. And your thesis can also be found on DIVAS, yes. all theses. Exactly. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, uh, Simon or Simon, and I think Simon. we should also give a shout out to your uh, partner, Ebba, who yes. unfortunately couldn't be here today, right? No. 
So the name of your thesis is Th Thriving in a Business Ecosystem, a study of role and capability alignment. And you're from the university, Technical University in uh, Luleå. Uh, yes, correct. So we have studied what capabilities companies need to have when working in a business ecosystem. So quite similar to what Vinit and David just discussed. And what we found was that the capability requirements largely depends on what type of role you have in the ecosystem, like what are you contributing with and what services you are bringing into the ecosystem. But we also found that uh, there are some common capabilities that you need to have in order to like collaborate and create a win-win situation and drive the innovation agenda. And, and what's this main capability that you need to have? The main ecosystem intelligence capabilities. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> now I think we should you know, make a note of this uh, concept, ecosystem intelligence. Yeah. It's not the last time we hear about it. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> it's uh, time now to start some of the drum rolls. Wait, 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 wait. Um, so, uh, to make this a little bit more exciting, we will start by announcing the second prize. And yes, we, we, they have no clue if they won the first, yeah. the second, or the third prize. <laughs> so it's quite a bit of suspense up here. Exactly. So, so the uh, you know the, the previous order had nothing to do with uh, the pricing order. So uh, drum roll, du -du 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 -dum. second prize, which is a travel grant of twenty thousand crowns, goes to. It's like Melo, you know. <laughs> Sophie, uh, passion for her thesis, big data within innovation processes. Congratulations. Lycka <laughs> till. <laughs> um, oh, please, please, please you, you, can, you can stay. Uh, the third. Uh, price and a travel grant of 15,000 uh, crowns goes to Carl Magnus Lunder and Emily Vorman from KTH. <laughs> Congratulations. And finally, the first prize. And a travel grant of 30,000 crowns goes to Simon Eriksson and Ebba Vindén for their thesis, Thriving in a Business Ecosystem. <laughs> so, uh, so, congratulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, once again, this is good work. And let's give them another ha big hand because if you read the thesis, you know they've done a really good job. Also, when you leave this room after you have mingled, we will have a, a, a limited number of short, um, short summaries that, uh, of the three different theses. And there's also be a longer summary in a while on our website. So if you don't want to read the whole thesis, you can read those. And they are quite good. So, and also, if you know students that are writing the bachelor master thesis, let them know about this opportunity because we're in the process of the next competition, so they go to innovationsuppsats.se mm -hmm. where they find all the information about this uh, thesis competition. So please let them know, and thank you very much, and congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> so, please, network, build your ecosystem. <laughs>